tracking white sharks in the ocean desert. And I welcome Scott Burr. Come on, Scott. Thanks a lot, Greg, uh, for that very nice introduction. Greg and I do go back a ways. Uh, it's good to be back here and see a lot of familiar faces and new faces. And, um, you know, this is what I was going to talk about, but not the only thing. I want to put it into context a little bit. And so I just wanted to start with a little anecdote. I'm flashing the, n the huge number of collaborators that uh, are part of this project. You probably recognize a lot of these names. But I did want to start with an, a, a true personal story that sort of puts things in context and tells you how I got to where I am, uh, for better or for worse. Um, I was, as uh, uh, Greg pointed out, a student, an undergrad at uh, Sonoma State University, and I was also working as a tech at the Bodega Marine Lab. It's a marine lab a lot like this one, not quite as nice. But um, there was a shark scientist there who Greg uh, uh, knows very well, Dr. Peter Klimley. And through him, I got this opportunity to go on a real research expedition. We were going to go down. It was an REU, Research Experience for Undergrads, um, go down to um, the Sea of Cortez and dive with hammerhead sharks in these big schools and count them and tag them. I was so excited. I called my mom. And there was this long silence on the other end of the line. And finally, she says, this is great. Um, maybe as a congratulatory present, I can get you some shark repellent. And so I was going, come on, like, Jane Goodall didn't wear chimpanzee repellent when she was out there, you know, <laughs> counting chimpanzees. But that conversation epitomized this, this predominant perception um, that still exists today. Beware of sharks. Sharks are dangerous. Um, so my career has kind of followed this path a little bit because we now know that Sharks are threatened. Uh, we know that because, and compared to beware of sharks, if we look at numbers, on average, 10 people are killed annually around the world, reported per year. The number of sharks killed by humans is on the order of 100 million per year, plus or minus 50 million. So um, the, the, the expedition was amazing. I had a great time. But I realized afterwards that I was actually documenting a decline. And in fact, today, this species, the scalloped hammerhead, is federally, federally listed on, as an endangered species, or on the Endangered Species uh, uh, Act. And so my career today is, is a lot about being aware of sharks. because. The sharks beware, the sharks are in danger isn't enough if you have this underlying perception that sharks are dangerous, they're menacing, they're all these things because people can't get behind the idea that, of committing to the policies or activities that we need to do to save them. So being aware of sharks kind of helps us move, uh, move the needle forward. And so, and there's two parts to that. The first part is dispelling some of the myths about beware of sharks. And the second part is learning all the, th the important things that we need to know population sizes, uh, uh, migratory corridors, areas, um, reproductive um, uh, parameters, um, discovering new species, all the things you know, that happen right here in this lab and, and that we all do uh, in this community. So with that bit of context, I'll move on. And we all know where this, uh, you know, beware of sharks took a foothold, right? And here in California, Close to home, we can look at uh, the statistics aggregated and see that Central California is uh, an area w that is, uh, you know, where there is some interaction between humans and, and white sharks. But so we, we looked at this, these data and, and, and tracked this over time to really ask the question, you know, because if you look at the news, the general perception is that shark attacks are increasing. The risk of shark attack is ever growing. We know that white sharks don't really attack people. It's maybe a misnomer. It's usually a case of mistaken identity. Victims are bitten but not consumed. But when we look at the, those data over time, you see a gradual uptick in the number of attacks. This is the, 
The first number here is the, is the mean over this half century. Uh, this is in 1950, uh, on average, 0.9 uh, attacks per year, up to 1.5. But what we did was sort of the obvious. How many people are in the water or are, are close to the ocean? And what has the, been the population increase in, in this case, in um, coastal counties over that same period? It's almost threefold. So we looked at this, the people as a denominator, and sort of just did the obvious and, and looked at all of these different activities, how they've grown over the year, and calculated a risk, per capita risk of attack. And in every case, it's declined uh, over the last uh, half century. In fact, it's declined overall 90% over the last 50 years. So this notion of beware of sharks, the white shark is sort of the poster child of you know, the most dangerous shark, but here we are. You know, San Francisco Bay is a metropolis adjacent to one of the largest, you know, aggregations, at least in the uh, uh, Eastern Pacific, of, of white sharks. And we can coexist, and uh, we can assign a value to that uh, wilderness, right? So one question is, you know, this 90% decrease, I get this question, does that represent a population decline? Why has it declined? Well. Interestingly, another innocent bystander, a mistaken identity, is a sea otter. Sea otters are bitten but not consumed by white sharks. They don't have the blubber that white sharks are after. Their risk of attack has increased during the same period. So it's the opposite result. And so I think what that, what that goes to show is that these are, may not be effective indices of abundance by themselves, and one thing that uh, we should think about is whether this is, you know, this uptick in this case and the downtick in the other is a, is a behavioral thing. One thing that we noticed in the data set is that over time, proximity of white shark interactions with humans uh, to known seal rookeries declined. In other words, humans were bitten increasingly close to uh, seal rookeries. And we know since at least the 1970s, uh, elephant seals have been on the rise and continue to rise almost exponentially um, at this time. So this is sort of addressing a paper that we did addressing that first part, is dispelling some of the myths. And, and the other part is, you know, learning about, uh, learning about white sharks. And that's sort of what led us down this road to this, you know, ocean desert. So I mentioned the inc uptick in uh, elephant seals following the uh, Marine Mammal Protection Act, and then following that at the Farallon Islands, an increased observation of, of white sharks um, preying on those seals. And, and the Farallons is one of the few sites in this area where we find, that we know of, aggregations of white sharks where we can go out and tag them. And so during these uh, field trips, we, we use a lot of different uh, uh, methodologies. Um, here, I'm not going to explain uh, uh, pop-up tags, but one of the initial results, starting with uh, Andre Bustani and our understanding of, of white sharks as coastal animals, we found that actually, when tagged uh, at the coast, these sharks spread out across the Eastern Pacific like this. Each point represents a daily estimate of a position, and this is a group of uh, 68 sharks. And so, I, I, you know, this is plotted over uh, chlorophyll. And you can see in, in the red color where the you know, obvious standing stock uh, productive areas of the, of the Pacific are. And so we got these three core areas. We've got the coast, which we know about. We have sharks going out to Hawaiian chain all the way out to Midway. And then we have this area here uh, we, we call the shark, White Shark Cafe. And so this is, you know, this is this strange place to go, considering it's, it's a very understudied area of the ocean, and largely because people have assumed for a long time that this is, uh, uh, you know, it's been referred to as the desert of the Pacific, you know, this, this part of the gyre. Um, and, and, it's, and it's weird. There's a seasonal component to this. 
every year uh, in October and November, the white sharks are on shore. They start moving off. And by June and July, most are offshore. Uh, and there's a lot of activity in the spring, in the next coming months, uh, in this area. And so I think about it a little bit like Burning Man. It's like Burning Man for white sharks. Here are these sharks. They're mostly from the Bay Area. Once a year, <laughs> they head out to this desert. God knows what they're doing out there, you know. Come back all dusty. <laughs> uh, but, you know, this sort of led us down this road. Like, what is this? What is this area? All, you know, what is this area about? So I've ended up uh, dedicating a lot of my thought and, and, and analysis to, to look at this question, and, and also my colleagues, Aaron Carlisle, who was a, a, a student here, who continues over at Hopkins, uh, he looked at stable isotopes. And first, what he did was calculate the probability of being at one of these three sites over the time of year. And it turns out that the offshore, these sharks may be more offshore than they are coastal animals because they spend a little bit more time, they spend more time offshore than they do onshore. Um, isotopic seascapes. Um, Hawaii and, and uh, uh, the pelagic area, which refers to the cafe, are you know, this, you know, prey, signatures and potential prey are significantly different than those uh, along the California current. So when we biopsy sharks and we look at their isotopic signatures that reflect their diet, we can sort of place where they're getting their food from. Now, here are potential prey sources. In California, these are individual prey items, and collectively they're represented by this green symbol. The same for the pelagic area um, and for Hawaii. Now, when we sample sharks, we find them in this in-between area. There are a number of things that go into this. If we're sampling a shark here, it's going to reflect higher, you know, its more recent diet, depending on the turnover rate of the particular tissue we're looking at. But what we found, the bottom line, is that uh, when uh, uh, Aaron ran this through this mixing model that uh, uh, our colleagues uh, built, is that white sharks feed at half the rate offshore as they do onshore. So there, a lot more calories are concern, consumed onshore. So that was one you know, piece of information about this offshore area. It's not like a real rich uh, area for feeding, per se. Now, there were some male-female differences. I showed you uh, a, a yearly cycle in the migration. Here I've separated those same points by color to represent males and females. And in this peak period in May, we find all of the males centered in that cafe area. Um, the males uh, are pretty reliably, every, every satellite tag that we've put out, the male if it stays on long enough, we'll end up in this place in the spring. The females are a little different. They move in, in and out of this area. Um, at different times, they have a sort of a different uh, rhythm. Now, so there's, there are sex differences. The males go there first. The females move uh, in through that area. There's not as much food out there. Thirdly, I spent a lot of time looking at uh, dive profiles that we could get from pop-up tags. Each column here represents a day, a shark diving day, and is colored by the percentage of time it's spent in these different depth bins. And if you take all of that information blindly without knowing its location, and you run it through a clustering algorithm and choose out you know, four basic groups, you come up uh, with these here. And you can see the, the, you know, quite different in their profile. Then you take, you color these and you throw them back on the map. And it's interesting that the map looks a lot like the male-female map where you have all this yellow right here in that same spot. And that corresponds with this type of behavior where there's a lot of time spent, you know, between 10 and 300 meters or so. Um, there's this red one we called the coastal cluster because all of these really fell along the coast for the most part. 
Uh, there's this travel where there's basically swimming at the surface. You can see these oftentimes were these uh, along these lines connecting the, the areas. And we had this sort of bimodal distribution here. Uh, we ended up, uh, I'll tell you in a minute how, uh, called this the Dail vertical migration because there was a time component to that. And that sort of spread out between Hawaii and the cafe and the larger region. Rapid oscillatory diving. Yeah, and I'll just, I'm just going to get to that here in a second, because then if you take uh, a subset of these tags have really high resolution archival data, and if you stack those up on a 24 hour period, um, this is what these different clusters look like. Okay, so the coastal period, the coastal uh, uh, behavior between noon and noon, it's pretty much the same day and night near the surface in the top 50 meters, kind of consistent with swimming around and around the Farallons looking up and, and you know, making charges to the surface. Travel, it's right on the skin. You can see a, a little echo, you know, uh, between the different groups. They're not perfectly categorized. They're arbitrarily one day chunks. Um, but they're swimming along the surface during travel. This dial vertical migration I mentioned, here it is. At nighttime, they're up in this shallower area. During the day, they're between 450 meters. Um, pretty reliable. It's a corridor at dawn and dusk uh, going from these two depths. And then this rapid oscillatory diving is all most, it's mostly up here in the top 250 meters. You can see some of the echo of the dial vertical migration as well there. So this is how they, they, they played out. And interestingly, this, this behavior, so I'll, I'll, let's, let's break these down a little bit. The dial vertical migration is something that we've seen in a lot of different organisms in the open ocean, in particular. S predators like squid do this day and night diving. This is a week, uh, days and nights. Um, and we know that they're largely tracking the deep scattering layer. I, I've heard you've had a lot of oceanography uh, talks, um, so I won't get too into that. But it's this blanket of potential prey items that the predators are likely tracking. In fact, uh, you can visualize this with the, your uh, uh, EcoSounder instruments. And you can see as you traverse uh, near the Hawaiian Islands, um, you can see the same day-night pattern uh, along the way. Other predators like big-eyed tuna have a very strong dial vertical migration. So all of that points to this type of behavior, tracking closely with that deep scattering layer with these other predators. Maybe this is a, a predator looking for something like a uh, big-eyed tuna, or there are some papers showing uh, uh, that uh, opa have been consumed in this area by, by white sharks. So we reasonably sure that this is some kind of foraging behavior, right? So what about uh, the rapid oscillatory behavior? This, if you look at it, and you have to look at just a day to, to, to understand what, what, what this is about, is crazy moving up and down between near the surface down to about 300 meters. Here I counted 150, day, 150 dives in a 24-hour period. So it's a lot of diving. Um, and this will go on day and night, relatively unchanged day and night uh, for weeks or months. Um, and so this you know, must be fairly energetically costly to do. It's different. And, 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 and Greg mentioned the top program, and we've tracked a lot of different prey, predators out in the, um, out in the Pacific, and, and none of, no, no other behavior that we've seen resembles this. The deep scattering layer, dial vertical migration, that's common. So this is this kind of mystery rapid oscillatory diet. So to return to the how do these two behaviors, so these are the two main offshore behaviors. Dial vertical migration, which we think is foraging, and this rapid oscillatory diving, which occurs mainly in the cafe. Um, how do they differ by sex? So if you look at the percentage of those behaviors, those are represented by the bars. The dark bar is the rapid oscillatory diving, and the light one, the dial vertical migration. If you look at that over the, over the season, 
over the year. Um, now let's talk, start with the males. They start off, this is the, the onshore period, right? February, they start moving off. They're doing this diurnal vertical migration. Come spring, it starts to switch over to this rapid oscillatory diving. This is where the males are all in the cafe, and this is where they are predominantly doing that at the, you know, at the expense of or in, in lieu of the uh, uh, diurnal vertical migration. For females, they start out uh, w you know, strongly with the diurnal vertical migration, and then there's a little bit of period that's coincident where they you know, have some other time dedicated to that behavior or actually visiting those same depths. It seems that their rate of movement up and down is not quite as fast as the males. But then that tapers off. So it seems like this kind of lasts all year round for the females. So there's a sex difference there. Now, if we look, you know, we saw that, the, 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 that rapid oscillatory diving was very centered in the cafe. And it's a large area. This is about 250 kilometer radius. Yeah, it's a pretty large area. But across all, you know, the data that we have that spans maybe eight years of different deployments, uh, different individuals, if we plot, you know, you know, where's the centroid of all that activity? And we say, where do these two um, behaviors occur in relation to that cafe center? If you look at rapid oscillatory diving, it's clearly highest right near the center and tapers off just almost linearly as you move away from that center. Uh, the diurnal vertical migration, there's no real pattern. There may be some sort of a hump in the middle here. You know, some, that might be expected because some of this occurs. If you're doing that, you can't be doing that. But the deep scattering layer, which we think the diurnal vertical migration is all about, is, is known to occur broadly in the ocean. It's not, you know, as patchy. Um, but this, and so that's consistent with this finding. Whereas this is very focused in that area. Another, you know, finding. So, so let's, let's look at those things again. So we have males predominantly moving out to that area. They're doing this energy intensive behavior. The females come along through there. They're doing a little bit of it. Uh, the females continue to what we think is feed uh, uh, continuously through that time, the males seem to give up feeding for that period of time. They're done. They come back to the coast. Um, we notice that they're skinny when they come back, and they bulk up uh, while they're here. We know that um, they're consuming more calories per time that they're at the coast uh, uh, twice, uh, than, twice as much as offshore. So the two sort of hypotheses that we've been thinking about is either this is uh, a foraging area, which one of the behaviors is consistent with. The other one, if rapid oscillatory diving is foraging, it would be focused, it would be something that would be sex specific or preferred by males for some reason. Um, there were no real s size differences per se in our sample size, but that's a possibility. It would also tend to be something that's uh, clearly aggregated in this area. So maybe some food source that we're not aware of. That's possible. Another possibility is this uh, courtship or mating hypothesis, where this could be a place where uh, males come first. They're doing some sort of searching behavior. It seems like searching in this area. Females come through that area at some point, and that's the male who can search the longest uh, may be the one who's more able to be more fit in, in the end because they're able to uh, mate more frequently. Now, I, you know, I put that out there. People th sometimes think I'm a little crazy. Like, how could that be? And, and uh, you know, I'm not really committing to one or the other. I think it's an open question, and we're still looking for, like, a really good uh, some type of evidence. So one other area that we're, we're looking at is the use of uh, activity trackers. This is, you know, this is the market for human use of activity trackers. Is anybody using activity track or Fitbit or anything like that? No? 
<laughs> okay, we got we. Well, I don't know where you've been, but apparently this is like a big. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, academics. What can you say? So, uh, well, if you if you do a Google search for you know this is becoming increasingly an important tool in studying animals in the wild in captivity. Uh, if you Google sharks and accelerometer, you've got this you know similar spike in the use. So. If you compare, you know, what, a, what is an activity tracker? It tracks your footsteps, and uh, you know, it, it, you know, look at what that is for human. Your steps. Your, if you're climbing, that's a lot of calories. These are calories consumed. And then, you know, if you're doing this program, you might track how many calories you're eating so that you can balance those. You know, humans have the luxury of trying to exercise a little more than uh, than they consume. You know, animals don't really have that <laughs> the luxury there, uh, it, but. The similarity is instead of steps, we're going to track tail beats, okay, and changes in depth. And uh, you know they don't keep journals on what they eat, so we have to find other ways to to figure that out. So maybe stomach data or something like that. So how do you? So uh, early work uh, uh, by Chris Lowe, uh, a friend and colleague of a lot of us here, it, uh, showed that uh, tail beat frequency. It's correlated with a measure of uh, metabolic rate um, O2 consumption. Uh, and this has been shown, and, and it's a pretty good relationship, especially with a fish that has primarily two muscles. You know, you can track that and get a reasonable idea of relative uh, energy expenditure. So we're trying to use some of these tools and so how do you put a Fitbit on a white shark? You feed it to them. So this is a, uh, this is a pad tag that normally goes on the outside of the shark. And this is a, you know early accelerometer when we're sort of building these things. Now you know phone is cheaper than that and does a better job these days. But um, it's a stinky job. This is a rancid mammal blubber. And you wrap it up and you feed it to the shark. Now it's got this Fitbit inside. And if you think that's gross, you should try retrieving it after the shark is, is done with it. Fortunately, it, you know, it doesn't come out the back. They spit it back up like, a, like, a, like an owl, like an owl pellet. So we get these things back. And you know, one question, I wish my, uh, I have uh, Connor White has just joined uh, our, our group, and he's working on this. But uh, one of the challenges is finding the orientation because you have these three axes of acceleration, x, y, z. But you don't really know what the orientation of your sensor is inside. And it could be moving around at a certain rate. So you have to distinguish what's moving around in digestion versus what is shark motion. Uh, and so that's a whole thing uh, we described in this paper. And, and uh, Connor, uh, if you want to know more about that, he's working with us now. And um, he can tell you all about that. But, one of the things is you have to, you look for these signals that you know are going to be there, the tail beat signal, which on a uh, you know, frequency plot, a fast Fourier transform kind of peaks out here, um, 2.8 tail beats per second. So you can find that. And if you rotate the, your, your axis system around, you can find where that peaks. And so then you can start to get at the tail beat and measuring all that. And the other. Uh, part of, of this is the is the temperature when a when a shark eats an endotherm. Um, there's an influx of cold water. It's a it's a pretty clear signature. This is a controlled experiment where, uh, in this first part of the graph, uh, this was a Monterey Bay operation with an ocean pen with a young white shark that was brought into this area before moving over here to be on display, where inside the aquarium now where the, the external temperature is, is more constant. But you can see the stomach temperature here, and you see these spikes during known feeding events. And so you know, this was a tremendous opportunity uh, to you know, ha have a white shark in a controlled environment, which is you know, extremely rare, um, to be able to get this baseline information. Um, and so if we look at a record from the wild, we can see the initial feeding temperature kind of goes up with that piece of blubber you saw. Uh, then the internal temperature kind of comes down. It's probably getting hungry. Here's a feeding event with this flush of cold water. And up again goes that um, 
uh, heat increment of feeding in, inside the, the shark's stomach. So it, it reflects what we see there. Then after you've uh, adjusted the uh, axes of the accelerometer, then you can reconstruct the motion uh, of the shark. And this is the depth trace at the moment when the shark consumes something in the wild. It's swimming along at you know 28 meters or so, and then it just starts blasting up to the surface. Um, these are these yellow and blue show the orientation. If it goes from zero to one, it means it's if it hits one, it's vertical. So it's almost vertical during this ascent. The red trace here is showing this motion, which is the tail beat, and so you can see that really increases in frequency and amplitude as it's climbing. And then you see this collision up here. This is the overall body acceleration. It's an integration of these three. And it gives you an idea of the overall locomotory energy expended by the, by the shark. And you can see when it's sort of at this baseline, when it peaks up, and when there's a potential struggle or prey handling, and then going back down like that. So this, this was an important step. Although these can't, you know, the longest we've had uh, this remain inside a shark's stomach was about 10 days before it came back up. But we have depth data coupled with that. So we can relate the acceleration data to these depth traces and then apply that across these longer tracks that we have going across the ocean. And one of the things that we found is that you know, a white shark will go through these periods, and this is the tail beat again in red, will glide down and power up and glide down and power up and glide down and power up at times, which is a pattern that you might see in birds and uh, other organisms moving through a fluid. It's hypothesized to be uh, an energy efficient way to move from point A to point B, more efficient perhaps than going in a straight line under constant locomotion. Um, so, but the key to this was that we identified these gliding points when sharks were gliding. And so we know that sharks store energy in their liver. They don't have blubber the way whales do. Uh, and we know that that varies tremendously with prey availability. And so uh, a livers can be enormous. A white shark liver was once measured to be 250 kilograms, a quarter of the body weight. And this can vary. So we hypothesize that a well-fed shark with a large liver, when it's gliding, is going to glide. It's, uh, the, the liver is also the buoyancy regulation. It doesn't have an air bladder, right? It would glide slower with a you know, good body condition, and it would glide down, sink faster with a, a depleted uh, you know, energy store. So we were able to measure this with these captive sharks because you know, they, came, they would come into the aquarium and they would get boneless filet of salmon, you know, every day, sustainably caught. Uh, and, uh, you know, they're, you know, so this is, uh, this is, their waistline is growing over here. This is girth to length ratio. We just measured this. Undergrad students did this with, you know, video and they just took measurements across in this way and tracked it over time. And we found that the sink rate was decreasing just as we would expect. So as these Sharks were increasing in their you know, uh, liver storage, their lipid storage, they, their descent rate uh, was decreasing as we expected. So then we took this and applied this into the wild and asked during those gliding periods, what happens as a shark moves from the coast of California out to the middle of the ocean or all the way out to, to the cafe, which can take you know, up to 40 days uh, of usually straight line swimming. And it turns out that their sink rate increases, meaning at least in part, they're tapping in to the, that lipid reserve that they've stocked up at the coast, and they're using that to power that offshore migration. So if we add that, we have you know, something where you know, migration is sort of this uncertain commitment. You know, this is an obligate ram ventilator, so it has to swim to breathe. Now, it could easily point in a straight line or keep swimming around the rock at Farallon Islands. It would be swimming the same speed, right? But cost can also be calculated in lost opportunity. So if you start moving offshore and swimming in a straight line, you're no longer going to have that 
opportunity where an elephant seal just falls in front of you and, and, and you grab it. So we're seeing that the sharks are here. They're feeding you know, greater calorie intake here. They're using, they're storing up. They come skinny. They bulk up. They use that energy to traverse across the ocean. And then they're doing this energy, the males doing this energy intensive activity. So we can add that um, to the thing. So what, what have we learned? You know, I should have had this slide up when I was, when I was mentioning that. Um, but in summary, for these, for these three areas, you know, tracking the, the white sharks from where the seals are, the elephant seals primarily, out to these two core areas, Hawaii, where we see predominantly diel vertical migration, probably a foraging type activity. Um, whereas in this ocean desert, the cafe, we see a split between these two behaviors, primarily the males doing this rapid oscillatory diving at a particular time of year when all, all the males are there. Um, so this is something that we're, we're looking at to try and resolve these two hypotheses. So one, one angle that we've been working on, and, and Tom is my partner in crime on this over at Ambari, uh, he's testing me on how to assemble this complex <laughs> Uh, uh, tag um, is trying to attach cameras on the on the sharks for extended periods of time to be able to see some of the stuff that we're just trying to recreate with all of these you know tools uh, that you know none of them are a real smoking gun to to, to really resolve this um, this question so that's uh, it's been challenging. It's a huge challenge. It's a very, uh, you know, so the, the ultimate goal would be to put one of these camera tags on, clip it onto the fin. It, the camera goes to sleep. The shark swims across to the cafe. It turns on at a time or during a behavior that we can recognize and record something that occurs very rarely in the life of a, of a shark. And then we retrieve the camera, download the data, and say, aha. <laughs> I was wrong, <laughs> right? Or what's the next question? So, um, you know, in the meantime, we can collect some information locally uh, with shorter deployments. And I'll just share with you a couple videos, you know, because this is fun, and, you know, and it's exciting. It's a high risk thing, uh, you know. This is sort of what it's like out at the Fairlawns. Attract a, a shark with a, with a cutout decoy that looks like a seal. Try and get the shark to, to swim up to the boat, and then, you know, try and get this camera to uh, uh, clip on while the shark is swimming next to the boat. So, it's not that easy, but, you know, there's a mandatory high five. <laughs> It's exciting. I'll show you a couple more of these. Uh, this one was part of a, a Discovery Channel Shark Week thing that we had. It just won a Best Science Film at the, at the Ocean um, Film Festival. But here's a sort of a bird's eye view of what that looks like. Unfortunately, here, the water visibility, as you can see, is, is a little less uh, 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 you know, leave something to be desired compared to what we think it is out in the uh, out in the cafe. We think that's a that's a oligotrophic zone that has, you know, exceptionally clear water. So we're hoping that, you know, um, but in the meantime, there we had some deployments in South Africa where you can get a little bit of the uh, point of view, you know, what types of things you can see. You know, here's an early uh, prototype early version. Here's the point of view from the shark. You can see clearly when it encounters other sharks or if it swims through potential prey sources, that kind of thing. So that's sort of our plan, uh, somewhat uh, a future direction. The other thing I mentioned is that um, I 
think this is going to be on slideshow. Um, we can relate some of the, the, those cameras also have accelerometers attached. And uh, we can relate some of the, uh, the this type of diving activity um, and really calculate a relative uh, energy budget, how expensive it is, is it to do this kind of thing? You know, what, how many calories would you need to eat to do that? And that might be sort of a backup plan or a way to, to inform this, uh, this question a little bit more. Um, other than that, uh, I also, you know, once again wanted to acknowledge the, the huge uh, number of people who, uh, you know, participate on this, on, on this project who have led to you know the, some of these papers um, you know white sharks you know we focused a lot on white sharks at the Monterey Bay Aquarium and and partly initially it was because that was a shark that uh, you know the, the, the aquarium for the first time was able to display for any length of time and so this was an opportunity while people were face to face with the shark we took the the money that was generated we we plowed it back into learning about these sharks we funded you know, the white shark uh, uh, program through top, and we continue to fund it. You know, if we can change attitudes and, and kind of dispel some myths about, uh, you know, this beware of sharks uh, theme that I mentioned with the poster child of, you know, uh, of Shark Week, maybe we can, you know, we can move the dial a little bit. But in the future, what we want to do is really apply this model um, with other shark species that are that are that are not as well known, that um, uh, that are in more need of conservation, white shark enjoys probably the is probably the most protected species uh, in the world. You know its numbers are naturally low because it's an apex predator, but still it has a lot of protections. Here, the folks here are discovering new species of shark that may already be, uh, you know, threatened before they've even been named or described by science. So there's a lot of there's a lot to do, and, it, and it's an area we want to sort of grow and apply this model and um, move into different shark species. So I wanted to mention that. Um, and then I wanted to thank some of the, the, the people on the boat and uh, just so many people, captains and, and stuff, who've helped out. And um, I'd be happy to take uh, questions. I'll end there. Oh, I know, too. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, I've always been under the impression that white sharks, even in the coastal region, don't seem to feed every day or even that often. Right. And we had students that did that, gastric evacuation yeah. and some other species that showed that. <clears throat> the data you showed there from the aquarium, they were feeding daily because they were being fed daily. You were looking at the right. temperatures. But the one you showed from the field, that looked like four or five days. Oh, yes. Is that right? Yes. And where was that? Offshore? That was, no, that was onshore. Onshore. Yeah. So we think that was, uh, that was a marine mammal, probably a harbor seal, okay. for various reasons I could get into. But anyway, what's your question? Yeah. That all makes sense to me. The question I have about feeding also is when they're at the cafe, yeah. the words imply that it's basically eat. The evidence is underwhelming that they're eating, except that they're doing that, whatever it was called, the hospital. Yeah. You mentioned some of the stable isotope data that yes. you and Aaron put together. Yeah. Stable isotopes can give you a trophic level depending on where you take the stable isotopes from. Yes. Are they from the vertebrae, from the tissue, or from what? They were from muscle tissue. Muscle. Okay. And uh, the dermal layer. Yeah, this white sharks have this sort of thick dermal layer. We don't know too much about it as far as turnover rates. There's a lot no more known about white muscle. Um, but uh, you know, it seems to have a faster turnover when we compare it, um, and you know that's yeah. So we we get this section, you know, a, little, a biopsy, and and it'll come back a little bit of muscle, this large dermal layer, and the der and the, and the skin. So could you tell from the types of stable isotopes that you saw, what kind of prey they might be consuming? I know that these occur in the yeah. stuff, and sort of came in yeah. and looked at vertebrae yeah. and growth zones in vertebrae yeah. to try to pick up what they were eating. Yeah. Not with the tissue. You can only. It's only. Yeah. Uh, you know, the turnover rate is on the order. Uh, you know, the half life. It's on the order. You know, we're talking about the order of a year. 
so for these tissues. So there's going to be some remnants, but it's not going to give you this historical reconstruction. You need that growth increment to do that. Now we are working with uh, Wade Smith, who was actually a, a long time uh, uh, Moss Landing, uh, and uh, Aaron on looking at some, uh, some vertebrae over time for the juveniles, because you have the birth area and you have those first uh, parts of life. But, you know, and some other folks, as you mentioned, have done that. But yeah, we can't get that resolution. I wish we could. Are you yeah. still don't know what the uh, No, no. Something that, that is, is in the deep scattering. Probably not McTophits. Right. It's probably something bigger. Are you about That's right. Um, other questions? What what I, I've noticed is that we that we do get year round uh, detections here. There there's this thing that they do sometimes is they'll swim all the way back here in the spring and turn around and go after after two days. And so there's some of that. There's also some younger sharks that are in the sort of, you know, when they first recruit from the nursery area, we think is in Southern California and Northern Baja to, you know, one of the adult uh, sites, either Central California. So I, I could speak to Central California. Some of the younger individuals <coughs> seem to be along the coast in the spring a little bit more. Yeah. Um, and in fact, you know, we've seen these last few years, a lot of them here in, in the bay, in the north part of the bay around Aptos. And, and I, what I think is going on is this may be another component. There may be a maturity component. You know, there has, you know, there's obviously a maturity component because when they're babies, they don't go out to the cafe. At some point, they start going out there. So when that is exactly, whether it's just before maturity or just after, you know, there's a little bit of uncertainty around the age at first maturity, there's natural variability and whatnot. So it's a little bit hard to disentangle that. But the younger sharks are not making that trip, or sometimes they're making short trips. So it seems to be a lot of the younger ones. This year, as I started to say, there was a lot of small sharks in the bay. And I think what's going on there is there's this little cell of warm water that forms up in the northern part of the bay. And that, you know, over this El Nino period, uh, you know, the sharks kind of forgot where Point Conception was because everything kind of warmed up and we saw all kinds of stuff come up here. And still do. That's, that's yeah, they're still here. So I anticipate that you know we should keep an eye out in the spring. We might see those the sharks a little bit larger, maybe. Uh, but maybe it's a regime, sh you know, it's a regime shift. I don't know. Maybe we'll see we'll see them again. But a no long-winded answer there. So Sal, the, the uh, distributional map with the uh, males and females um, depicts to me a lack. You know. Yeah. Lacks. So it looks kind of uh, how birds do lacking. Yeah. Which is the males will get in a certain location and display, and then the females come through, and there's probably some system selection on the part of the females of which male they're going to mate with. Yeah. You, have you thought about the, sort of the lucking um, concept? And, yeah. And that would indicate that the females are making a choice based upon some attribute of the animal, which is maybe the speed at which they're going vertically up and down in the water column. But, so have you come up you, with anything that's like that? Yeah, I'm glad you asked that, because you know, I, I tend to shy away from the word lek, but this is exactly what everybody says when they see this migratory pattern. If you stand back and you forget that these dots are sharks and you forget the scale of it all and you just, you know, say, you know, somebody just presented you on a map, it didn't show the ocean or anything, and they said, this is what males and females are doing. That's where a lot of people go. It's like, this looks like lek mating behavior. The thing that... Um, people commonly think about lex is that, uh, you know, a lot of times, and when it was first described in birds, it's about the males putting on some display of excessive plumage or, you know, energy, uh, you know, energy intensive behavior, something that's above and beyond their, you know, showing that they have all this excess energy. And then the female chooses the one that's displaying the most and those are have and become selective because, and, and so the plumes get larger based on this because they mate more. What's, I find, you know, but people don't often know that it's not always a selection that the female makes. In this case, 
I, I think there may be something like that. And if I were to go down that road and say, you know, what could this be? I would say that that searching may be uh, the males are using their olfactory, uh, you know, lobes, which we know is quite well developed. Uh, we know from a few species that females signal their readiness to um, couple, you know, uh, through the release of pheromones. Now, that up and down is centered on the thermocline out there. So if you were to release pheromones in the thermocline, in that stratified water, its dispersal would be like a pancake. It would just spread out like this. And so maybe the, the males are moving up and down to find, you know, to, through that layer. When they locate it, they can track the gradient. And the male that searches the longest and the hardest is going to finally find it in this big, you know, area. So that would, you know, in, in other systems are like this kind of uh, idea of uh, endurance competition. It's not the female necessarily that's choosing. Now it's the male that's choosing, but the selective element is still there, how that behavior would get perpetuated evolutionarily. But if you were a female going into that area and you yes. knew that males were going to be in that certain location, the expectation would be is if you were a female and wanted to, to encounter a male, you would go to a certain spot, right? You yes. would not go up and down. Exactly. You would stay at some yes. level and let the male come yes. find you, which would indicate that the male wouldn't be going up and down because they, they would know where the female was at a certain distance. At a certain depth. depth. Yeah. So you wouldn't have the oscillatory movement of the males to find the females. So it does make sense that if the female's trying to find a mate, that they would be doing the same thing. So the, the difference, though, is that w there's a vertical velocity component, because we can calculate that based on the pressure sensor. They're moving at sometimes one meter per second going up and down. That's equivalent of the, what they normally swim. And that's very fast. But the females aren't moving up and down at that speed. The females are occupying the similar depth, but they're not doing that, as far as we can tell. We don't have a huge N of, of you know, archival tags to really tease that. But the few that we have, they don't show. Uh, any vertical fast swimming by the females. So I don't know. It's an open question. It's an interesting one. I'd love to talk about. Well, evolutionary speaking, if the females have preserved energy for, for the reproduction, right. part, then their strategy of uh, moving up and down is not using energy in finding of the mate would then correspond to the males' Having, energy to find the mate right. because they don't need to keep that reserve. They can go back, top up, come back. They can die faster when they're slimmer or maybe that. Yeah. I mean, there is clearly, if you just try and use logic, which often doesn't always work, <laughs> it, would, it would seem to be a nice, a nice theory. Yeah. No, I agree. It's it's a starting point, and you know we get you know I'm always a it's always this sort of ledge where where does the hand waving begin and, and you know the discussions and and but you know we, we have to look at the evidence and uh, and that's why I keep using the term cafe. Cafe could be somewhere where you. Uh, go to eat, but it could be somewhere where you might go and, and meet somebody special. So, yeah. <laughs> so, uh, why would you, as a lecturer, spend that much time in a place where there's not as much food as on shore? And if you were going to yeah. you need more water to make, right. why would you go south? Uh, you know, good question. The, uh, you know, people, the people who, you know, there's some people who believe the opposite, that these aggregations must be where they're mating. Nobody's ever observed mating. Um, so, you know, uh, but, uh, you know, why haven't they observed it at the coast if this is where they do it? Because guess what? You know, I've spent the last, you know, I've seen hundreds, you know, hundreds of encounters. I've seen females and males, you know, everything. I've been out there so much for 10 years. There's people like Scott Anderson. There's people, there's cage divers in clear water at these sites every day. Thousands of cameras rolling all the time. Nobody's ever seen it. So where else could it occur? And you look at the map and where are the, you know, the points. So there's that. I, it's a really good question because what, you know, they're spread out there. Here they're close together. I think maybe Jim could uh, expand on the, the, this, but it's my understanding that lek systems, the lek actually occurs away from food sources. 
and I, I can't remember what the evolutionary reason for that is, but I think that's almost always the case. Um, there, you know, warm water, yeah, I don't know. This is good. I beat myself up with that one. Can you go to the next slash page? Sure. We know that you and the aquarium, the people before you, collected their juveniles, and under the years, some of them right after birth, yeah. in Southern California. Right. Every time that they were tracked after here, one of them died at the birth of them, they all went back south. Beelined it, yeah. They beelined. So the, yeah, the juveniles that are back in them tend to do that up and down thing, or maybe just the down thing. Uh, what I'm getting at is there's a whole other group that walked away. Yes. Out. Right. In addition to yours, where are those juveniles coming from? Females that are from the Guadalupe group, or from yeah. the Feral and the Huevo group, or do you have any idea? Um, that's good. There's something I forgot to mention is that there is this Guadalupe adult group. Uh, you know, another interesting point is they all go to the cafe as well. That's right. And they come back to Guadalupe. Rarely, we're starting to see one or two move back and forth through photo IDs, through some tagging, and we still have to publish that. Uh, they're largely separate, but this is an area every year where they're in that same area, which supports maybe the mating idea a little bit more. This is where, you know, panmixia can occur, you know, these two groups that seem separate. There are some conflicting genetic uh, data right now suggesting that there is a genetic difference, but the latest paper says there's not now. So, you know, I think we, yeah, yeah. But what we do know, I mean, we're just start. we know that adult, uh, juveniles move across the border back and forth with the season. Also, we, with Chris, we've been putting on these long-term acoustic tags that are internally implanted, they're lasting seven years, and we just had, you know, we've had a couple move up into this area at the four-year mark, and one uh, moved down to Guadalupe. So it appears that it's a, maybe a common nursery area and that, uh, you know, they maybe imprint on one side or the other. They're very habitual, you know. These, we've had photo ID matching. Uh, uh, first and recent photo spanning 26, 27, 20 years. Same individuals. Very habitual. So maybe they imprint on, on one side or the other at some point. It's, it's crazy. You don't think a primitive, you know, think back. Like, I mean, this kind of, we always assume it's mindless you know, malevolent creepers were, you know, but they have this, you know, such a... Prior to the Tom Brady's paper, yeah. everybody, nobody had any idea they would be blessed. Yeah. No idea. Some two threatened were found in the white on the beaches. Let's take one more question so that we can get to the viewers. <laughs> Tom. There's a population you... in uh, South Africa. Yes. Do they have a cafe or cooking? In that. So the, the, they have a tropical migration. They go up around the corner up to Mozambique in the Mozambican channel there. Apparently all the sharks have ever been tracked have gone into the warmer water uh, and back. Australia New Zealand, they go up to some of the South Pacific islands. It, does, it seems like there's this warm, cold thing also. Maybe, but we, you know, I've been talking to folks there. They haven't identified a region per se. That, that's like this. But we think that this group here has been separated, you know, based on the genetics for on the order of 200,000 years from Australia and New Zealand, despite their ability to transmigrate the whole ocean. Uh, and that's that this population is seeded from uh, Australia and New Zealand population. There's a, there's a lot more diversity there. This seems to be a founder population with low diversity. And it's separate from that. It's separate from uh, across uh, the Pacific in the north from Japan, so. Thank you. A lot of